Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for attending this first Warriors Corner of the Day. Please join me in welcoming Major General Cedric Wins, Commanding General of the Research, Development, and Engineering Command. Thank you. Okay, I'd just like to say good morning to everybody. I am uh, Major General Cedric Wins. I'm the Commanding General of uh, U.S. Army Research, Development, Engineering Command. And uh, I appreciate you all taking the time to spend uh, with us to talk a little bit about one of the Army's priorities, and that priority is about lethality uh, for the soldier. Uh, and in this particular area, we're going to talk about lethality as it pertains to uh, two areas, uh, long-range fires, uh, and second, uh, our ability to combat threats who have long-range fires with our integrated air and missile defense capabilities. Uh, and so what I want to do is just talk a little bit about those because uh, the Chief of Staff of the Army and the Secretary of the Army have identified a deficit or a challenge that we have in long-range fires uh, as one of the Army's priorities. Uh, and one of the reasons why uh, long-range fires have been identified is because uh, in the studies that we've done uh, and the investigations and the war gaming that has taken place, uh, we recognize that over the last 15 years of combat, uh, our adversaries, potential adversaries, have watched us and watched the capabilities that we have and begun to uh, come up with counters in terms of capabilities. So right now, uh, based on various different models, based on various different simulations, we see ourselves as being, uh, in many cases, against potential adversaries being uh, outranged and outgunned. Uh, and so that presents the challenge for us, which is uh, our ability to turn that equation around uh, so that we can regain uh, or reattain the, the overmatch capability that we have. So uh, what I want to do is I want to talk about uh, things very quickly on one slide, and then I want to show you a video to give you an idea of some of the examples of potential threats that uh, we might possibly face uh, in any type of combat scenario that we think we'll be a part of. Uh, and then I'm going to ask two experts uh, to come up and talk to you a little bit about in uh, long-range fires in their respective areas. Uh, and they'll talk about how we're getting after uh, some things that are going to cut and increase speed of delivery and the technology that we work uh, in collaboration many times with industry in collaboration with academia, uh, and in collaboration with our international partners to bring about this capability for the warfighter. Uh, if we could go to the first slide. So here's our problem. Our problem is that we face uh, against potential adversaries in a contested environment, uh, what we refer to as uh, the A2AD dilemma, uh, anti-access aerial denial. We have a situation where we believe that going into that environment uh, we may be outranged and we may be outgunned, and we uh, are not sure uh, that uh, what we have experienced in many decades of uh, conflict, um, air superiority may be resident uh, because of this dilemma. And so as a result, uh, we believe that there is a need for us to increase the capabilities that we have, uh, not only in our long-range precision fires, but in our ability to combat enemy threats that uh, enemies would present to us with their long-range capabilities. Uh, this is also a key feature in multi-domain battle uh, because uh, multi-domain battle is certainly a joint problem, uh, and our ability to get after uh, this joint problem will require uh, ground forces to be able to seize, exploit, and retain the initiative. And how do you get that initiative? You, well, you get that initiative by your ability to suppress, neutralize, or destroy an enemy's capability. And the further we can uh, do those things to an enemy's capability, uh, then when we get to the close fight, uh, we have attrited the forces of our enemies uh, to a point where our lethal capabilities will allow our soldiers on the ground to fight and win. And so that's the problem. Uh, we see it as being something that we have to increase the range uh, we have to cr increase the lethality of our systems with precision fires uh, at greater distances, far greater than what we get out of our cannon artillery presently and far greater than what we get out of our rocket 
artillery systems uh, presently. Uh, as far as our air defense capability, uh, we see the need to have the ability at the uh, various different ranges dealing with all kinds of threats uh, that can inflict indirect fires or air fires on our formations. Uh, we see the need to uh, bring about uh, capabilities that provide us an integrated approach, provide us an ability to uh, get uh, after air threats uh, and indirect threats uh, at the uh, lower tier, the mid tier, and the upper tier uh, of our uh, missile defense systems to give us an integrated capability. Uh, so that's the problem. Uh, it plays, again, as I mentioned, in multi-domain battle because it allows for the commanders to have these windows of opportunities to exploit that initiative uh, and to seize it and to continue momentum going forward uh, to defeat any adversary. So what I'd like to do next is I'd like to go to a video to just give you an idea of what these uh, capabilities are that we believe some of our adversaries have. Uh, and then I'd like to uh, introduce and have uh, Colonel Rich Hornstein, who is out of our Armaments Research Development Engineering Center, and uh, Dr. Mike Richmond, who is out of our Aviation Missile Research Development Engineering Center down in Huntsville, Alabama, to come up and talk a little bit about those various different capabilities. So if we could run the video, please. Colonel Rich Hornstein. from the threat, right? We, we're, we're driven by the threat that we have to face. Um, over the past 10 to 15 years, uh, we've become very, very efficient at counterinsurgent operations. Um, and during this time frame, we've had adversaries that have focused on what our strengths were and have really designed capabilities um, to counter us. So we find ourselves in a unique, it's not a unique position, but an uncomfortable and an unfamiliar position as the U.S. forces to have parity in certain areas and actually face overmatch and being outgunned in certain areas. So the intent of our deck is to uh, develop IRCA and develop ERAP, these extended range accurate projectiles, and to deploy that or at least demonstrate that capability in FY18. So next slide, please. All right, so the, the Legion Army, right? So I put the the Roman Legion up here for a couple reasons. One, to state that fundamentally the nature of warfare has not changed since the Roman Legion. Um, war by its very nature is a human endeavor, right? So the things that have changed are the doctrine, the armaments, and the TTPs. But it's interesting to note that the Romans themselves 
leveraged um, artillery and indirect fire as part of their campaigns that they conducted. And not only that, they leveraged multi-domain indirect fires. Uh, when they're conducting siege warfare, it would be from the maritime domain. Um, so the, the, the thing that we want to avoid is what occurred to the, the, with the, the Romans in Cannae when Hannibal uh, defeated them because they did not uh, evolve in their thoughts and their doctrine and uh, uh, their, their, their tactics to face an opposition that way. Next slide, please. Okay, so the great thing about our nation, the great thing about our military is that we are very sound in terms of doctrine and the way that we produce products and think about warfare. But our doctrine is very well studied by our adversaries. And as I indicated before, our adversaries have paid attention to what provided us a, a, a wealth of advantage in terms of uh, capability. And what they've done is uh, they've taken advantage of a timeline over the past 10 to 15 years and modernized their forces when we haven't. So next slide, please. All right, so this, this kind of shows you a linear pro progression of indirect fire. So that chart up in the upper left-hand corner shows you what we were doing with the smooth and rifle bores in Civil War time frame through World War I, World War II, uh, really to the, the, to the current time frame. And the one thing you clearly see with that is an increase in range and an increase in lethality. So we're going to continue that increase in range an increase in precision lethality with the delivery of IRCA and ERAP, and it will provide overmatch. So next slide, please. All right, the other thing that we have found out is that our technology is studied by our adversaries, right, and our global near-peer threats. Um, they reverse engineered a lot of our capability. This is the reason why you see the, the current um, jet fighter from the Chinese looks remarkably like the F-35. The uh, reason why you see um, destroyers being launched by our adversaries look remarkably like the Aegis. So we were developing long-range fires with a 52-millimeter cannon on the Crusader um, over a decade and a half ago. So we decided to remain with a lighter caliber so we would be more expeditionary, but many of the global adversaries took our technology and modernized it. Um, and this is what we're gonna revisit. We're um, actually looking at uh, extending, again, making a larger caliber extended tube system uh, to provide overmatch. So can we go to the next slide, which is our programmatic slide here, right? So here's the things that the Army and our DCOM will be delivering. So. The, the capability that we call extended range cannon artillery is not just a gun, right? As I indicated before, it's projectile, it's cannon, um, it's fire control, uh, it is in a mobile platform, and it's on a towed platform. So we have transition arrangements right now with project manager self-propelled howitzer systems, project manager combat ammunition systems, and project manager tactical artillery systems. And FY18, we're going to demonstrate this capability either at White Sands Missile Range or at Yuma, but this will provide overmatch. We've got additional resources, and we've heard that this is a priority from the Army, and we were able to push this to the left to increase the velocity of our capability that we're developing by five years. So um, lighter weight systems, we're going to have uh, these extended range projectiles, as I indicated, will still if they're fired from legacy systems, we'll still provide extended range. Um, so uh, from our perspective, this is a good effort by the Army and um, uh, we'll deliver the capability that our Army needs. So I think this concludes my portion of the briefing. What I'd like to do at this point in time is uh, turn off the floor to uh, Dr. Mike Richmond. Uh, as indicated, he is from the missile side of the house and we'll talk about long range precision fires, but a little longer than what I've been talking about in terms of uh, cannon artillery. Thank you very much. Thanks, Colonel. As I mentioned, I'm Mike Richmond. I'm the Associate Director for Missile uh, Development at the 
the Army Aviation Missile Research Development and Engineering Center in Huntsville. Next slide, please. Next. And next. So, so I, I'm going to focus here on, on uh, the missile side of the house uh, and, and talk a little bit in the next slide uh, scene setting in terms of multi-domain battle and what we're doing integrated across guns and missiles. But, but from our perspective, we've got four main capability areas that all contribute to multi-domain battle. Uh, air defense, shooting anything out of the sky. Uh, fire support, ranging out all the way to 499 kilometers. Uh, ground tactical, all of our close combat uh, missile systems, and then uh, aviation missiles. As you can see by the wheel, uh, we're integrated across all those mission areas, coordinating with three centers of excellence, fire center, maneuver center, and aviation, while supporting at the same time seven program managers over PEO, missile, and space. And so from this perspective, what you get is that uh, we've got an integrated approach across all mission areas, again, as we discussed earlier, to reach out and engage the enemy as far out as possible and provide uh, freedom of maneuver for our uh, maneuver force on the battlefield. So next slide. Uh, we've talked about this uh, a couple times so far. Really what we're talking about is a, uh, a continuity of lethality. Uh, a continuity all the way 499 kilometers down for guns and missile systems, again, to reach out and engage the enemy as far out as possible, and then a continuity of lethality for air defense. Again, gun systems and missile systems working in concert at various tiers to make sure that if those long-range fires do come in, that we can intercept them before they impact the mission of the maneuver force. And again, you can see here the uh, capabilities enabled from the missile SMP at every level, ground tactical, air defense, aviation, weapons, and fires, we are looking to provide the most flexible weapons, the longest range weapons, weapons with the greatest lethality against a uh, multiple set of targets, uh, and, and weapons that are affordable and can give us the deepest magazine possible. So with that, I'm going to talk about uh, three of our specific efforts. Uh, next slide. Low-cost tactical extended range missile, LC term. This is a feeder s and program uh, for long-range precision fires. Uh, what we're doing at AMRDEC is uh, pushing the state-of-the-art technology for propulsion systems to be able to get our missile systems to extend as far as they can in the smallest diameter possible. Uh, we're also uh, working technologies to reduce their dependence on GPS and we're working technologies for multi-purpose payloads. So a single missile system that can go after point targets as well as uh, area engagement. Uh, as you can see the timeline here, we hope to have this demonstrated TRL-6 in a relevant environment by uh, FY21. Uh, if successful, and, and so far we're on track, what we're looking at is a significant range extension over ATACMS with a two to three X increase in magazine depth. So you can see that capability that you're getting with the current force structure that we have today. And, and that's a huge uh, multiplier in terms of, again, being able to reach out and engage the enemy before they uh, uh, can engage uh, our, our troops on the ground. Next slide. Uh, talk about multi-domain battle. So the land-based anti-ship really is, from the missile perspective, that first instantiation of a multi-domain battle scenario. Uh, what we're looking at is adapting existing Army, Marine Corps, HIMARS, MLRS rocket systems to be able to go after maritime and land-based air defense systems. So what you have here is, again, current force structure using advanced technology to go after targets in multiple domains. Uh, the uh, uh, intent here is that uh, we'll have this demonstrated in the relevant environment uh, by 23. Uh, we'll integrate the component technologies into prototype missile and hardware and demonstrate that. And uh, uh, the plan is that uh, using the current GMLRS, HIMARS, launcher, force structure, MOSs, uh, we will give the Army forces a freedom, freedom of maneuver, uh, both uh, in the littoral area as well as, uh, as well as on the land. And again, this is our first instantiation of, uh, from a missile perspective, what we feel is, uh, is truly multi-domain battle. Next slide. Low cost extended range air defense, lower AD. Uh, what we're doing here is uh, low cost is paramount. Um, the, uh, the missile systems of today, and, and certainly the folks within RDECOM and, and, uh, and specifically down there in Huntsville, um, they've got a tremendous capability to provide 
uh, mission set that we don't have today. They can go after a multitude of targets. However, we need to be able to afford those systems. Uh, we cannot break the bank every time we pull the trigger. So what we're focusing here on is infusing air defense missiles with technology so that we can afford to buy sufficient numbers of those to constitute a true capability. Uh, looking at high degree of reuse of existing technology, uh, looking at leverage S&T investment uh, common across programs, and minimize impact on force structure. Again, minimizing impact on force structure. If we can go in and use existing launchers, use existing radars for multiple missions, that's really we, where we think the bang for the buck is in terms of low cost air defense. The other philosophy here that we're working on is a common front end of the missile. So if, if the front guidance electronics unit of lower AD is common and can be used across various mission sets and the range then comes from a variety of propulsion systems that you uh, put on the back of that system, uh, again, you can get an economy that, that spans multiple uh, missions, multiple launchers, multiple capabilities. And that's really where we start to buy down that cost. Pending any questions, that's all I have for uh, missile systems. Uh, I'll invite uh, General Wins back up to uh, close us down on the final slide and prepare for questions. Uh, so, there we go. Uh, as I said, uh, this is all about getting after uh, one of the Army's challenges and one of the Army's priorities now uh, in terms of long-range precision fires, uh, increased lethality to the warfighter uh, so that we, as the research development and engineering arm of the Army, uh, are all about focusing on the warfighter and delivering those technologies that lead to capabilities that will empower, unburden, and protect the warfighter. Uh, and this is one that we're clearly focused on. Uh, we're going to attack it on a couple of different fronts, uh, both in terms of our cannon artillery systems uh, and then to get those further extended ranges through our missile uh, and rocket systems. Uh, so uh, speed of delivery is important to us, and so our teams uh, are really looking for those opportunities to partner uh, with industry, academia, international partners uh, to bring about these technologies quicker uh, so that then we can go about uh, getting after the other challenges of how you integrate these things into a meaningful platform uh, that will deliver. Uh, so I thank you all for your time and attention, and uh, we'll stand by for any questions that you all may have. Yes, ma'am. Hi, I'm Lara Seligman. I'm a reporter with Aviation Week. Um, the last capability um, that you talked about, the land-based anti-ship missile, um, it looked similar to something that the SCO rolled out um, recently, the upgraded ATACMS. Is, can you t just tell me what, if there's any relationship or if it's the same capability, or what, what the difference is exactly? So, so one of the beauties about uh, both working in RDECOM and, and throughout DOD is that it's highly encouraged that we leverage efforts going on from uh, uh, other agencies and, and other departments within DOD. Uh, certainly our folks are closely linked to the, uh, uh, the SCO, the Strategic Capabilities Office, and, and what we're doing is making sure we have a clear knowledge transfer of the mission set that they're, they're going after and how that differs from uh, what we're doing in land-based antiship and how it complements what we're doing in land-based antiship. Ultimately, at the end of the day, um, what we want to do with El Basm is feed it into the current Army force structure and fight the way the Army fights uh, with a missile system that can go out into uh, uh, maritime targets. Uh, so yeah, we are certainly branching out to the maximum extent, taking advantage of uh, what other services and uh, certainly the SCO are doing. I, th I think it's a uh, complementary capability that uh, gives uh, the DOD flexibility in terms of solutions to go after a specific mission set. Well, I, I think what we're uh, certainly trying to do in land-based and ship is to feed technology to long-term program record. Uh, and I think also what uh, is being explored is uh, identifying technologies that can give us early on capability, may, maybe not a, a full capability set that uh, a long-term uh, POR might want. So the, the, um, one of the big differences, I believe, uh, is, number one, 
uh, the outcome that you're trying to get out of the SCO effort uh, versus uh, the outcome that we're trying to get in our research development and engineering efforts. Uh, these efforts uh, tend to be uh, those things that we're trying to deliver uh, in terms of technology that can insert themselves into existing programs or records or new programs of records over the mid and far term, uh, whereas the SCO effort uh, is really uh, uh, more about innovation in terms of delivering a capability that exists uh, through innovation. So using existing technologies and trying to uh, identify a demonstrable a demonstrable uh, capability in a very, very short period of time, two to five years. Uh, so uh, the collaboration that goes on is about looking at some of the features uh, that our engineers are working in collaboration uh, with the SCO folks uh, to see how uh, you can create multiple different platforms and multiple dis different solutions uh, that would be available to the commander uh, to engage in multi-domain battle, be it from uh, ground to ground or from ground to the maritime domain. Hi, my name is Dr. Charles. I'm the Vice President for Research and Development at RLM Communications. It would seem as though that machine learning and AI could increase your accuracy, and I'm wondering whether that's part of your research that you're doing right now in this um, instrumentation and also on this piece of weapon, and how do small companies um, get engaged with the research that you're doing? Okay, so um, how do small companies get involved? Uh, one of the things that we've done and we continue to do is kind of champion the idea of collaboration and collaboration early. Uh, and the ability uh, of us to get after developing technology solutions is to bring the best of um, industry uh, to these problem sets to help us solve them, bring some of the technology that industry has. Uh, and that goes from the very, very large companies uh, to the very small companies. Uh, the avenues by which you get in, there are a number of different ways, depending on if you're talking about early research areas. Uh, we have cooperative agreements uh, that we have worked with uh, industry partners uh, which are agreements that say, hey, we've def identified a problem set uh, that we would like to work and foster collaboration with you. Uh, and it uh, amounts to uh, those industry partners uh, working with our research development centers or our labs. Uh, one of our, uh, our Army Research Lab, uh, they have um, innovation hubs uh, where uh, they open up their space uh, for opportunities to collaborate with, uh, with folks in industry. Um, with respect to the second part of your question about uh, artificial intelligence, uh, we are looking at both in uh, basic and applied research uh, as well as the more advanced research and getting to prototyping efforts, those opportunities where uh, we understand what artificial intelligence and machine learning can do uh, to increase uh, our ability to see and decide uh, and to characterize different types of threats much faster and then to begin to uh, come up with solutions that will allow for decision makers still inserted in the process at the center of the process to make the uh, decision of a go or no go on engagement of a particular target uh, and how that information gets disseminated across the battlefield uh, so that you have situational understanding, situational awareness of what's going on on the battlefield. Okay. Any other questions? just curious when lasers might become part of the solution. So I think that's a good question. So today we really focused on guns and missile systems, but again, that continuum of lethality, both for air defense and long-range fire, I believe you're going to see our partners over at Space and Missile Defense Command, who are uh, leading the charge on uh, developing laser technology, really integrate into that singular message on being able to provide air defense as far around as possible and, and, uh, and technologies. Uh, that complement both gun systems and missile systems.
Okay. Uh, no further questions. I thank you all for your time and attention, and uh, we appreciate uh, your interest in uh, what the Army is doing in the area of lethality uh, through its cannon and rocket artillery system. So thanks.